The next information board in the exhibit is entitled The Two Apostate Revisionists. Brooke Foss Westcott, an Anglican bishop and professor at Cambridge University, and Fenton John Anthony Hort, also an ordained minister and professor at Cambridge, produced a Greek New Testament in 1881 based on the findings of Tischeldorf. This Greek New Testament was the basis for the revised version of that same year. They also developed a theory of textual criticism, which underlay the Greek New Testament and several other Greek New Testaments since. Greek New Testaments such as these produced most of the modern English translations of the Bible that we have today. On one side, their supporters have heralded them as great men of God having greatly advanced the search for the original Greek text. On the other side, their opponents have leveled charges of heresy, infidelity, apostasy, and many others, claiming that they are guilty of wreaking great damage on the true text of Scripture. I have no desire to sling mud, nor a desire to hide the facts. I just want to share the truth about these men. So put on your seatbelt and get ready for a quick ride through the beliefs of Westcott and Hort. In order to give you an idea of what they really believed and what their real intentions were when creating their Greek New Testament, I will let the men speak for themselves. I will tell you nothing. I will merely let these two men speak for themselves. The rest of this page will only be quotations. If this makes you angry, don't be angry with me. I'm just giving you what the words of Westcott and Hort. Remember Job chapter 9 verses 20. Mine own mouth shall condemn me. Concerning the deity of Christ, he never speaks of himself directly as God, but the aim of his revelation was to lead men to see God in him. John does not expressly affirm the identification of the Word with Jesus Christ. Concerning the Scriptures, I reject the infallibility of the Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Our Bible, as well as our faith, is a mere compromise. Evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. Concerning Hell Hell is not the place of punishment of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. We have no sure knowledge of future punishment, and the word eternal has a far higher meaning. Concerning Creation No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. But the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. Concerning the Atonement I think I mentioned to you before Campbell's book on the Atonement, which is invaluable as far as it goes, but unluckily he knows nothing except Protestant theology. The popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing can be more unscriptural than the limiting of Christ bearing our sins and suffering to his death, but indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. I confess, I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of a ransom paid to Satan. I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of a ransom is at all tenable Anything is better than the doctrine of a ransom to the Father. Concerning man, it is of course true that we can only know God through human forms, but then I think the whole Bible echoes the language of Genesis 1.27 and so assures us that human forms are divine forms. Protestants must unlearn the crazy horror of the idea of priesthood. Concerning Roman Catholicism, I wish I could see to what forgotten truth Mary Altry the worship of the Virgin Mary, bears witness. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common. The pure Romish view seems to be near and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. I agree with you in thinking it a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory. The idea of purgation, cleansing by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us of the divine chastisements. Concerning the cumulative effect of multiple changes to the manuscripts. It is quite impossible to judge the value of what appear to be trifling alterations merely by reading them one after another. Taken together, they have often important bearings which few would think of at first. The difference between a picture, say of Raphael, and a feeble copy of it is made up of a number of trivial differences. We have successfully resisted being warned off dangerous ground, where the needs of revision require that it should not be shirked. It is, one can hardly doubt, the beginning of a new period in church history. 
so far the angry objectors have reason for their astonishment. It is one thing to have doctrinal differences on baby sprinkling and perhaps a few other interpretations. It is quite another to be a Darwinian theologian who rejects the authority of scriptures, biblical salvation, the reality of hell, substitutionary atonement, makes Christ a created being to be worshipped with Mary his mother, and to openly admit that your trifling alterations with the Greek text have begun a new period in church history. Yet these were the views of both Westcott and Hort. This is unbelievable. No less significant is the fact that both men were involved with the occult and were member of the Spiritist Societies, the Hermes Club and the Ghostly Guild, and both men supposedly talked to spirits of the dead. The modern Bible versions are playing a dangerous and disastrous game of follow the leader. The modern Bibles are based on the Nestle Allen Greek text, which is based on the Nestle's Greek text, which is based on the Westcott and Hort Greek text, which follows the readings of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus.